Okay, great. So the, the main focus of this is for me to talk to you about fertility treatments after you're diagnosed with cancer. Now I do a little bit of before as well, just in case there are people out there who haven't quite completed their treatments or are in the middle of their treatments, um, or in case you have friends or family members who want that information, but mostly the goal is to talk about what happens um, after you are diagnosed with cancer and have had some treatments. So the outline that I have here um, is basically, we're gonna walk through cancer statistics just so we all understand how common this is. Um, I'm gonna reverse this order, so I'll come out of the presentation just um, because of who we have here. We don't have any men on the call, so I'm gonna do female reproduction and cancer, and then I'll probably do adoption and barriers and solutions, and then I'll go back in and we'll do male reproduction and cancer just so we have that recorded. And each time I go through, I'm gonna talk about how the cancer treatment impacts fertility, and then what your different options are um, before and after treatments. And again, like I said, stop me at any point if you have questions, Melody, or if anyone else pops on, because um, mm -hmm. the whole point of this is for you guys to get the information you want. Mm -hmm. So we all know this, cancer is unbelievably common, probably because we are living a lot longer than we used to. Um, the lifetime risk for all cancers in men is one in two, and for females, one in three. So um, extremely common, obviously in women, breast cancer, one in eight, prostate cancer, one in six for men. So those are going to be the big ticket um, um, items, but obviously they, cancer can occur anywhere. And each cancer has a different treatment, so that's what makes it sometimes a little bit difficult about understanding the fertility ramifications before you get treatment. And sometimes um, physicians are not extremely well-versed if they trained in cancer to understand, oh gosh, I should also be telling people worry about your fertility based on this treatment because they might treat different types of cancer as well. So it's something, that, something to keep in mind and be educated on yourself. The good news is cancer is extremely common, but most people who are young when they're diagnosed with it live um, pretty long. So we're actually doing pretty well with treating um, cancer and about 77% of people under 45 survive at least five years, which is great. Um, one of the important things to understand from my fertility world, the one thing that trumps just about everything is age. And one of the challenges that we are facing right now for people with and without cancer who want to um, undergo fertility treatments is we're just getting older when we want to have children, right? We're waiting for you know, our careers to be set. We're waiting to be financially stable. And then the next thing we know, we're in our late 20s, early 30s, we're getting diagnosed with cancer. And now we're told we have to have treatment for a couple of years. And now we're in our late 30s, early 40s. And that time in the late 20s to early 40s is huge. That's where we start to see a big decline in fertility. So time, um, time really matters in my world. Okay, so let me end this, jump forward, and then I'll come back and cover men just for the recording. But I want to give Melody, and Melody, you're more than welcome to stay on and listen if you want, but just in case you have other things you need to do tonight or you want to go outside. <laughs> Okay, so female reproduction and cancer. So one of the big differences between men and women is men make sperm every single day, which is great for them because they have constant machinery working to make new gametes, meaning more sperm. Women are not that lucky. So we are born with all of the eggs we are ever going to have. And over time, the amount of eggs we have declines, okay? two things happen over time. The egg quantity or the number of eggs that we have goes down and the quality decreases as well. And the reason is just time. And the other part of that is because they are with us our entire life, they are exposed to everything that we are exposed to. So if you smoked at some point, your eggs have seen smoke. You know, if you have had cancer treatment at some point, your eggs have also seen that as well. So um, that is one of the biggest challenges that we have is we have not figured out how to reactivate or start to make new eggs. When we do, this field becomes very cool, but not yet. Um, 
Okay, I'm not gonna go into the menstrual cycle too much, uh, but I think it's important because when I start talking about fertility treatments for women, everything that I do in, in the fertility world is manipulate the menstrual cycle. So what that means is your body each month is, is going through a process to grow an egg. And how it does that is there is a conversation that goes on between the brain and the ovary, okay? So each month, you actually have a group of potential eggs that kind of bubble to the surface of the, of the ovary, and those are potential eggs of the month. Your body is going to naturally select out one of those eggs to ovulate, which is why you typically get pregnant with one kiddo at a time, okay? Um, and you ovulate about mid-cycle. So the whole first part of your cycle when you're on your period and for about the first 14 days, if you have a strict 28-day cycle, is growing the egg. You then ovulate. Second half of the cycle is all about that egg getting fertilized and implanting into the uterus. So when we start talking about the effects that cancer can have on our fertility, um, it's important to kind of have that background. So one of the ways um, that we see um, cancer attacking these cells is your, your chemotherapy or your radiation are going to attack rapidly dividing cells, right? So that's what the problem is with cancer is one of the cells starts growing and growing and growing and it lost that checkpoint to go through um, uh, scheduled cell death. So when we look at what are the out potential impacts of cancer on um, in cancer treatments on fertility, we're looking at it's gonna potentially decrease the number of eggs and result in an early menopause. It might cause an early germ cell failure, meaning you're going to have um, what we call premature ovarian insufficiency. We used to call it failure, but then we thought that was a little too harsh, even though it still says it in the presentation, but it's technically insufficiency. It can also reduce the production of ovarian hormones. So if you remember the slide before, or a whole bunch of hormones that I didn't quite go over because it gets very confusing very quickly, but your ovaries not only give you an egg, but they also give you estrogen and progesterone, right? And so if your um, ovaries are damaged, sometimes you get a reduction in estrogen progesterone, which is important. We'll talk about that a little bit later, um, but you need that um, for a lot of reasons, especially if you're young when you're getting diagnosed. Um, if you might have uterine scarring, tube scarring, or vascular damage um, to the uterus as well. And that's more with radiation, and I'll go into that also. So chemotherapy and radiation both negatively affect our ability um, to conceive, and they do it in different ways. So chemotherapy, like I said, is geared towards attacking cells that are rapidly dividing. Unfortunately, those are our egg cells. Okay, um, how aggressive the chemotherapy is against the eggs definitely depends on the type of chemotherapy that um, you are getting. And I'm gonna show you a table in a second that breaks down the different um, chemotherapies based on high risk for ovarian failure, medium, and so on and so forth. Um, some women become Subfertile, meaning they still have some eggs, but the eggs that they have are not performing to the ability that we like, you know, prior to getting chemotherapy. Some women go into complete menopause, and some women are completely fine after therapy. So you have to keep that in mind. It's it's a gradient, and just because I say it's a high risk, it doesn't always 100% for the most part. Although some treatments do, um, they're not going to completely knock out your reproductive ability. If you are young, this is probably my, my biggest take home point. If you enter menopause, you have to be on hormone replacement therapy. And the reason is estrogen is needed for bone health. So you don't get osteoporosis or osteopenia or have fractures. It's important for cardiovascular protection. So reduces your risk for um, heart attacks and heart disease um, You know, later on in life, but much younger than you would have been if you were younger, as well as um, protects your brain. So in women who go through early menopause, we see an increased risk for Alzheimer's and other type of um, 
dementia-like syndromes earlier on in life. So estrogen is super important. So if you are given treatment and you are noticing after the treatment, meaning you're not on some other type of therapy that's preventing you from getting a period, like you're off all treatments together and you're not getting a period, you probably want to see you know, either an infertility doc, because we do reproductive endocrinology as well, or your ob gyne and get put on um, hormone replacement therapy. A little bit about that depends on your type of cancer, so it's gonna be a conversation between you and your um, oncologist as well. But usually if it's a really low dose, it's okay. But it, it's, a, it's always gonna be a balance. And then like I said, some women after, after chemotherapy have regular monthly periods and, so, and no impact on fertility. So it, it very much varies um, by, based on treatment and person to person. So you'll wanna just see how, see how your body responds afterwards. Radiation um, can also impact um, fertility. It does it a little bit differently, obviously, than the chemotherapy does. Um, this works um, by damaging potentially the eggs, again, if you have direct radiation to the ovaries, or it can also damage the uterus and cause fibrosis. If it's a low dose of radiation, you might be fine, um, but it, we always worry about what happened to the vascular supply around the uterus. So remember, when you are growing a, a child, your blood flow to your uterus is crazy high, and you need a lot of blood flow because that's how the nutrients are gonna get to that child. Um, and so we do see in people who've even had a low amount of um, radiation, an increased risk of miscarriage and preterm labor. So always a good idea to review with a high-risk doctor. We call them in our world maternal fetal medicine specialists. It just means it's a high-risk OB doc to say, hey, I've had this type of radiation. What do you think my risks are? Sometimes it's easy to tell. Sometimes it's not easy. And they might say, proceed at your own risk. Um, if you have high-dose total body radiation, or you're most likely going to have premature ovarian insufficiency, which is POI, meaning you're going to enter premature menopause because um, it's going to get your ovaries, it's going to, it's going to get everything. The other thing to keep in mind, so sometimes people are like, well, I had brain radiation. Why do I have to worry about my fertility? Well, remember back to when I was talking about the menstrual cycle, the brain is what talks to the ovary to get those eggs to grow. So if you irradiate the brain, you can potentially affect the ability for that conversation to take place. And so it's not an issue with the ovary, it's an issue with the brain, okay? Because all those hormones are secreted from the pituitary gland, which is in the brain. So if that gets irradiated, then you might have an issue. Now, the good news is that one I can fix pretty easily because I can actually just give you injections of those hormones to grow the eggs. So that one I can fix fairly easily, but you might be like, oh my gosh, I don't have a period. I'm in menopause. Um, this is horrible. I'm never going to have kids, but really it's a brain issue, not, not a ovary or uterine issue. Okay. So this is the table that's crazy busy, but I wanted to include it because I'm sure, you know, if people look through this in the future, they might say, okay, well, I've had this therapy what's my risk? And I think it's really helpful. Um, you can also look on Fertile Hope's website. They're great. Um, they have all of this information. But basically what they do is they break down, um, I don't know if I can point, yeah. So they break down the degree of risk um, at the treatment protocol and why we typically would use those chemotherapy medications, right? So High risk are gonna be your alkylating chemotherapy agents, um, which we use typically in like a Hodgkin lymphoma, ovarian cancer, sarcoma. And then obviously I'm not gonna go through all of these. Um, some of the breast um, cancer treatments, depending on what, what you have, might um, cause a high risk. But again, notice nothing here says 100%, so just keep that in mind. And then it kind of breaks it down as, we, as, um, as you move down. Some of these drugs we don't know. We just don't have enough data on yet um, to see, to say where it falls in that risk stratification. Okay, 
So options for women. So again, I just gave you that background because I think sometimes if you don't have that background information, it makes it harder to understand what I'm talking about when I'm talking about the treatments. Um, okay. So I, again, I added the before, during, and after in here because I, you know, I don't know where everyone is in their treatment cycles. Um, so if you have not received any treatment yet, our options are the following. You can freeze embryos or you can freeze eggs. The only difference between those are, do you have a male partner? So if you are currently um, in a relationship with a man, then you, and you are in a committed relationship and you wanna have children with him, then you most likely will freeze embryos. So an embryo is just a fertilized egg. So um, that's the main difference there. If you don't have a partner or if you have a wishy-washy partner, then you would freeze eggs. And the reason why I say wishy-washy is once we fertilize those eggs, legally they belong to both of you. And this is your one shot at this. So I usually tell people, unless you are absolutely sure you want um, to legally bind yourselves with that other person, then you wanna just freeze eggs because we can fertilize those eggs in the future with anybody's sperm, including donor sperm. So keep that in mind. Um, ovarian tissue freezing. So this was experimental literally until this year. There are still only a certain number of centers across um, the country who are doing it. Um, just because it's not hugely done and because it was recently pulled off being quote experimental from the American Society for Reproductive Medicine. But this is in essence going in and taking tissue from the ovary, cryopreserving it, and then with the hopes of putting it back in in a future time period and hoping that it will go back in and act like normal functioning ovarian tissue. Um, in vitro maturation, we don't really do that anymore. That's basically not stimulating um, uh, the eggs and just going in and, <clears throat> excuse me, trying to take immature eggs. There's not really a reason for that because I can get eggs that are mature pretty quickly. Ovarian transposition is for patients undergoing radiation. So that means we literally just go in, operate, and move the ovaries up out of the pelvis so that if you have to get radiation to the pelvis, it's not impacting your ovaries. Um, we can always go in and release them in the future, um, or we, if we're gonna do IVF in the future after that, we can do an abdominal retrieval, it's fine. Um, during treatment, so one of the, I probably should have put the egg and embryo freezing in the during treatment category as well. So some people, depending on the type of cancer you have, will get chemo or radiation intensely for like, let's say three or four weeks. And then you get like a six week or two month or something like that break. And then you'll start in again. It's possible to try to go in and retrieve and do an egg retrieval in that interim time period. We see obviously some impact on the eggs, the number, the quality, so on and so forth in those women. But depending on the chemotherapy, it, it might be okay. So, so that should also probably be checked. And then GnRH agonist, I'm gonna talk about in a second. Um, everything that I talked about for the most part, obviously not ovarian transposition can be done after as well. And then importantly, so if you focus down here, things that we can do after natural conception. So if you're getting regular periods, and I'll talk about this in a second, you, you certainly can try on your own. Um, in vitro fertilization, same thing, donor eggs or embryos, we'll talk about that, adoption or gestational surrogacy or gestational carrier if we cannot use your uterus. And I'm gonna jump into all of those in more detail. Okay, so the GnRH analog treatment. So this is, this has been very interesting to follow in our field. So the theory behind this is um, a GnRH agonist initially will cause an increase in the release of hormones from the pituitary. So short term, it causes a flare effect, but long term, your brain can't handle that. So it starts to decrease the receptors, meaning it decreases that hormone and in essence shuts the brain down so that you're not going through monthly cycles. So the theory is it puts your body in essence into menopause with the hopes that <clears throat> you aren't gonna have the quote rapidly dividing cells that aren't going to be impacted by the chemotherapy. 
that's the theory behind it. Um, the problem is the data has never really proven that it is um, it works. There's some studies that suggest a benefit, some studies that don't. Um, it can be done monthly or it can be actually done in three month intervals as well. Um, I usually tell people it certainly isn't going to hurt anything. Um, you are going to get benefit from it because at least you're not going to have a period while you're going through chemotherapy. Um, so it's something to think about. It's like I said, it certainly won't hurt anything because it's a temporary menopause. It's on, it's off. Um, but again, is it really going to protect your ovaries? I'm not sure. Okay. So after you have your treatment, the big question is what impact did that treatment have on what we call ovarian reserve. So ovarian reserve means where are we at in this ovary aging process, right? Are your ovaries still at, you know, if you were age 30, are your ovaries still acting like a 30 year old's ovaries or after chemotherapy, are they acting like a 40 or a 50 year old's ovaries? And there are different tests that we can do um, to help us understand where your ovaries are at, okay? Probably the most commonly talked about one is the second one on the list here, and that's called an anti-malarian hormone blood test. So what is that? So anti-malarian hormone is a hormone that's secreted from the eggs deep down in the ovary. That level is, can be measured in different assays. So it's tough to say this is a good level. And this is where I really caution people against Dr. Google because a number of 1.5 on one assay might be fine and on another assay might be incredibly low. So th the number actually matters where it falls on the spectrum. Some lab tests in medicine, it just is, as long as it's in the reference range, it's quote normal. That is not this test. Um, and it's the opposite of golf. You want a higher score, not a lower score. <laughs> you want to like golf like I do and when, with your AMH. Um, so that's probably um, the most commonly used. It's also most, the most accurate. If it comes back undetectable, it tells us, all right, most of those eggs are damaged. The other th test that we can do, one of them is called an antral follicle count. So we can do an ultrasound. We usually do it transvaginally just because that gets us closest to the ovaries. And what we look at are the potential eggs of the, of the month. So remember how I said each month you have a group of eggs that bubble to the surface of the ovary as potential eggs. As we age or at, if we have ovarian damage, that number goes down. So in your 20s, you might have 30 potential eggs of the month. And remember, you're only going to select out one. When you're 40, you might have one or two. Okay. So you have an idea when we scan you, okay, if there's two potential eggs there, I'm going to say, oh, okay, you know, your ovaries are behaving like a 40 year old, even though you're in your twenties, you know, so there was some, clearly some damage there. Um, the third test, probably my least favorite, although sometimes is helpful in this situation is the day three FSH and E2. So if you again, go back to that schematic that I showed of the menstrual cycle, FSH stands for follicle stimulating hormone. And so it does exactly what it says that it does. It stimulates a follicle or an egg to grow. As women age, I usually say it's, it's like the ovaries age as well, and they become hard of hearing. And what do you do when someone can't hear you? You shout at them. And so if you check a, an FSH level on day three when it should be low and it's really high, it tells me that your brain is working really hard to get that ovary to respond. And in essence, when your FSH is through the roof, it tells me, okay, we're in menopause. So when you're in menopause, your FSH is crazy high and your estrogen is low because your brain is shouting at your ovary, but the ovary can't respond with estrogen. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I would say, you know, this varies. Most women are told to wait a little bit of time be between chemo or radiation or whatever their treatment is before conceiving. Obviously, one of the big things you worry about is recurrence, which is 
not something you want to be pregnant with when you have recurrence because your treatments are minimal um, and pregnancy is a long time. Um, so usually they'll make you wait. And then depending on what chemo radiation you have, they might recommend you undergo a heart evaluation, a lung evaluation, renal evaluation, or kidney, excuse me, common name, um, or liver evaluation, just to make sure that you don't have any abnormalities before entering into pregnancy. Um, pregnancy is wreaks havoc on your body um, and can be very, very challenging for women, especially if you're walking in with a baseline issue. Um, so it's really important that um, you let your ob know, your oncologist know like, hey, I'm thinking about becoming pregnant. What do you think? You know, and they might run a bunch of panels to make sure they think it's safe for you to get pregnant. <clears throat> and if not, I'll talk about an option for you as well. Okay. So uh, again, like I said, if you're getting regular periods after your treatments, go for it. You know, I probably wouldn't try... Um, for more than six months. Um, the recommendation if you're less than 35 is to try for a year, but if you've had treatments before, I probably would say six months is a reasonable time period just because we know you already have a lower potential chance of conception given the, the, the health history. And I would schedule an appointment with um, an infertility doc. And again, it's just REI stands for Reproductive Endocrinology and Infertility Specialist. Okay. So let's say you come in and I say, look, you know, you're, you have some eggs, but it's lower than I would expect for your age. Um, and you're, you've tried for six months and you're not getting pregnant. What are your options? So we have two different options. And part of this depends on obviously your partner as well. If he has an issue, then that, that changes things. But let's assume he's normal. So one option is we could try something called an intrauterine insemination or IUI. And what we do with this is we either give you injections or an oral medication to increase the number of eggs you're ovulating each month. So that gives you more chances. So you might get three or four eggs. So in essence, you're squeezing three or four months into one month. Obviously, this increases your risk of multiples if we do that. But if you've tried doing, you know, with one egg each month, obviously something is going on. So most people would recommend somewhere growing somewhere between three and four eggs if you can. We then time placing the sperm into the uterus at the time of ovulation. And that's a minor procedure, not a big deal, no anesthesia, none of that stuff. Your partner basically comes into the office, gives us a sperm sample. We clean it, we process it, takes about an hour to do that. <clears throat> we put in a speculum like when you get a pap smear and we pass a tiny catheter through the cervix and inject the sperm into the uterus, okay? The other option is IVF. So you might say, you know, or we might try IUIs, they don't work, and we start thinking about IVF. IVF is a little bit more complicated than I, and I have some pictures to kind of help simulate this, but I'll walk you through it um, from a bird's eye view first. Um, basically, what we do is we give you shots, so no oral medications, and the reason is instead of growing three or four eggs, this time I want to grow as many eggs as I possibly can in, in your ovaries. Um, we give you shots. It usually takes about 10 to 14 days on those shots to grow eggs. Um, during, the, during the shot process, you're typically coming into our office every three days, every two days, sometimes back-to-back -back days to get blood work and ultrasound to make sure that you're responding to the medications. We watch the, the follicles grow on the ultrasound and we watch your estrogen go up to tell us, okay, you're responding to these medications. We then trigger ovulation, but before you ovulate, we go in and collect the eggs under anesthesia. Um, and then if you have a partner, we fertilize them with sperm at that time. Um, and we can either use your partner's sperm or if you wanna use donor sperm, that's an option as well. And then we would put the embryo back into your uterus at some point in the future. Now, one of the things to note about that, um, and this is a schematic going through that, is for people who haven't gone through um, their treatment yet, or people who are in the middle, it really only takes me like two weeks to get eggs, you know? Um, so sometimes people are like, I just don't have time. I need to start, you know, my chemo or my radiation right away. I would say very rarely do I hear an oncologist say like, it needs to be started today. 
versus it can wait two weeks if fertility in the future is important to you, not a problem. And same thing with the interim. If you get a break, I only need a, a short break in order to try to get these eggs. This is um, a schematic. It's a terrible schematic, sorry, but um, <laughs> it simplifies it um, a little too much, but that's fine. Um, this over here is your ovary and these are the eggs growing. So again, on ultrasound, you can see those eggs growing. The retrieval is done under anesthesia, but it's usually conscious sedation. So it's not the breathing tube, scary anesthesia. We stick a tiny needle through the vagina into the ovary. Needle is hooked up to suction. That pulls fluid out of the follicle and with that generally comes the egg. Our embryologist looks at the test tube right away and says, yep, I got the egg. He fertilizes it later that day. We grow it out in the lab for about five to six days, and then we do a minor procedure, no anesthesia, and we put the embryo back into the uterus. So it sounds big and scary, but it's, it's, it's really not. Um, the risks of anything bad happening with um, a retrieval, less than 1%. It's a pretty safe procedure. So, um, I think a lot of people get scared because they're like, oh, my hormones and all of that stuff. And even if you have um, hormonal responsive cancers, I can keep your estrogen level low by putting you on letrozole therapy during the stimulation cycle. So I don't even have to raise your estrogen crazy high. It's still going to go up. I can't keep it suppressed, but it's not, I can keep it somewhat reasonably low um, by putting you on letrozole during your stimulation cycle. So for people who have that, I would not let that deter you either. Um, this is just what an egg looks like. It's beautiful. Um, it's big, it's full of water. This is a fertilized egg. And how I know that is instead of just being a big bowl of water right here, you can see there's um, a dot here and a dot here. This is actually 23 chromosomes from mom and 23 chromosomes from dad. And these are actually little sperm around the outside. So this was a naturally fertilized egg. This is what an embryo looks like, okay? Um, and so this is an embryo hatching out of its shell. So this is like the hard egg shell um, and it's hatching out. And this is what we call an expanded blastocyst, which is a great looking embryo. It's beautiful. Okay. So like I said, IVF and embryo freezing can be done before, during, or after treatment, but after treatment only if we have any remaining ovarian reserve. If you don't have any ovarian reserve, IVF is not going to work, um, meaning I need eggs to be there in order for this process to be successful. If I do the testing and there's, there are no eggs, this, this is not going to work. We, like I said, we're, we're, we have not come to that ability yet in the field. Um, like I said, for people who have hormonal responsive um, cancers like breast cancer, ER positive, um, I can keep your estrogen levels somewhat low. Um, I'm gonna go over cost in a little bit, but cost for patients with um, cancer is pretty minimal. So at our center, we basically charge um, for fee for cost. So there's, there's no profit for us when we do it. Um, your medications are usually insanely expensive, but um, there are two foundations um, that help pay for the medications for patients. So for the most part, those are free. Now I will say one of the caveats with that is sometimes getting the medications from them can take like a week or so. So that if time is of the essence, sometimes that slows me down a bit. Sometimes I have samples in our clinic that I can give you to get you moving. It just, it just depends. But usually cost is not as crazy as if you Google IVF, you know, um, it's, it's most, most places reduce their cost. Um, the other cool thing is embryos can be stored probably indefinitely. So we, we flash freeze these embryos. They are frozen instantaneously and when they're thawed instantaneously. And the oldest person that was born from a frozen embryo was just frozen shy, just shy of 25 years. Totally normal kid. It's pretty cool. So if you're like, oh my gosh, I'm going to be on treatment for 10, 15 years, fine. Totally fine. You know, if you're in your 20s, that's, that's a no-brainer. Um, that embryo can just stay frozen. Um, you know, obviously we have the uterus and the health issues as you age that we have to keep in mind, but um, from a storage standpoint, that's okay. 
If you have a specific mutation that causes cancer and you're like, you know what? I don't wanna use my eggs because I don't wanna pass that down to my future generations. We can actually test the embryos. So we can look to see if the embryos are carriers for any of these disorders. And it, it probably honestly gets bigger than this if you happen to have something rare that I'm not aware of. Most of the time we can make a probe against those genetic disorders um, so that we can test the embryos to see one, is it chromosomally normal? And two, does it carry the same genetic disorder? And then we don't put those embryos back in. We only put back the normal embryos. Um, if you are someone who has frozen eggs or embryos and you're like, well, now what do I do? I'm through my treatments. This is pretty straightforward. Basically, um, if you have frozen eggs and you now have a partner, we thaw the eggs, we fertilize them, and then we do a transfer like I showed you before where we put the embryos back into the uterus. Now, we usually put you on hormones to manipulate the cycle, so we don't usually use a natural cycle. You can. Pregnancy rates are lower, so we use, usually use artificial estrogen and progesterone um, during those cycles, but it's, it's still pretty straightforward. If you have prior frozen embryos, really easy. We transfer them into your uterus or if you can't carry um, into a gestational carrier and I will walk you through that. So let's say you come into my office and I say, look, you know, you don't have any ovarian reserve. I'm so sorry, your ovaries just are not working anymore. Well, then what are your options? So probably my, the most common and widely used option is using donor eggs. So these are women who want to donate their eggs to another couple. Um, this is highly regulated by the FDA. So all of the egg donors have had psych, legal, FDA labs, and physicals completed. Um, there are two different um, types of eggs that you can use. You can use a fresh egg donor or you can use a frozen egg donor from a frozen egg bank. A fresh egg donor is someone who is going to go through that IVF process that I just talked about. And every single egg that she gets belongs to you. The second that they are out of her body, legally they belong to you. They're fertilized with your partner's sperm, grown out, and then put back into your uterus. Um, you can use an anonymous donor or you can use a known donor. Um, the cost is not that much different. The only thing that you probably would save if you use a known donor is um, paying them if they don't want to get um, any compensation. Um, but you still have to pay for the psych, legal, FDA labs, and physical, and all of that stuff. So you can't squeak by without that. The other problem I see a lot of times with known donors is they're like in their late 30s. And I'm going to say, oh my gosh, no, you know, you want to give yourself the best chance if you're going to spend all that money. You want someone who's young, healthy, and has a great ovarian reserve. Unless you really want, it's like your sister and you really want it and we, you want to give it a whirl. That's, we will, we can try. Um, there are all different places that you can look at to do this. Locally here in Madison, I think we probably are the least expensive for fresh egg donors. And the reason is we just don't charge an agency fee. Um, other agencies locally here are for Forward Fertility and Stork Society. There are national agencies that you can use. Um, the downside for them is cost. And then you, the egg donor, you have to pay for them to fly here, stay in a hotel, so on and so forth. So it gets a little bit costly, but you know you might not find the person locally here in Madison that you like. So you, you might think about that. Frozen eggs are people who've already gone through the IVF process. Their eggs are frozen and these egg banks are selling you a group of eggs. The reason why I think it's less popular is they usually sell them in cohorts of six eggs. Six eggs is not a lot of eggs. We usually get maybe one to two embryos out of that if we're lucky. Um, when we use a fresh egg donor, um, you know, I don't know, it depends, 15 to 30 eggs, I would say on average. So you, the numbers are different. Cost seems to be more with the fresh eggs initially, but over time, it's, if you factor in the numbers that you're getting, it's less, especially if you want more than one child. The other option is you could say, you know what, either I don't have a partner or if we can't use my genetics, we don't wanna use the genetics of my partner either. In which case you would just adopt an embryo. So this is an egg and a sperm that are not gonna be genetically linked to you or your partner. Um, the benefit of this is you still experience pregnancy and childbirth. Um, these embryos are typically donated by people who've gone through the IVF process, have surplus embryos, their families are complete, and they want to help out other couples. Um, again, 
options, um, the most common options that people use are us. We have a, um, our own program. It has a pretty hefty waiting list about mm, two to three years. So that one's, so that's not great. Um, Forward Fertility, Snowflake, and Embryos Alive are other national agencies that you could look into. So let's say you, you had frozen embryos and now you had radiation and the doctors are saying, mm, you know, you can't use your uterus or you've had a hysterectomy. So at this point, you would start thinking about what's called a gestational carrier. So someone else carries your embryo. So it's your eggs, partner, sperm, you've done IVF, you have a frozen embryo, and we transfer that embryo into a third party woman's uterus. Um, things that are important about this, this um, can sometimes be legally challenging. It depends on the state that you are in. You want to make sure that you con consult with a reproductive lawyer um, because some states, for example, Michigan is basically illegal. You want to make sure that she delivers in a, a friendly state so you don't have any legal issues with, um, you know, um, who the child belongs to. Although all of that will be set out in your legal document beforehand. This is obviously extremely expensive. Um, the cost there, although it, it varies even more than that. Um, again, you the reason why you have the cost is agency, legal fees, medical expenses for the carrier, psych, and then compensation for being a carrier. Sometimes you have to pay if she's put out of work. You know, there's, there's a lot of things to think about. Cost goes down, obviously, if you use a known carrier. Options, again, I listed there um, some of the most common um, options. Again, we do it at our institute. Surrogacy Center um, around here does it. Forward Fertility Pink and Blue are the most common ones that we work with. Okay, so one question that I get a lot of times is, well, shoot, I don't want to have a child after cancer if it's going to cause any issues. Um, as of now, we don't seem to see any issues in any of the children. We don't see, seem to see any issues in um, the people who have recovered. Now, obviously, this depends on how long you've been since you've had treatment, but for the most part, we don't see an increase in recurrence. Um, we, um, uh, for the most part, um, don't see issues um, years out either, um, especially if you've fully recovered from your treatments. Again, birth defects, no different than the general population in women who have cancer. Um, no increased risk um, for genetic diseases. Um, and there haven't been an increased cancer risk outside of if you have a genetic you know, um, gene link that would cause an increased um, risk for cancer. No increased risk in offspring from, from survivors. Adoption, so I'll, I'll briefly go through this. Um, just because I'm running out of time a little bit. Um, so when we talk about adoption, so let's say you say, you know what, that's great, but we just want to adopt a child. Um, one of the things I always start to say is, we can help you with that too. Um, start to think about what's important to you in adoption. Do you want a, chi you know, a child? Do you want a baby? Do you want a teenager? Do you want them from this country? Do you want them not from this country? Um, and the other thing to, to note is it's also quite expensive to adopt, which is insane. Um, but it is, um, and it sometimes can take um, a long time. So it varies, again, depending on which option you choose and the um, uh, agency that you work with, but, um, but it can take quite a bit of time depending on what your needs are, especially if you want a, a baby, those tend to you know, um, be a little bit harder um, to establish those relationships. There are different ways that you can adopt. So there are adoption agencies or something that people know about less. There are adoption lawyers who help um, find um, um, children who need to be adopted and help pair intended parents with them. There are public agencies, um, and these are agencies that take children from abusive homes. There are private agencies that you can adopt from, um, and then the adoption lawyers. Um, the laws very much just like the gestational carrier laws vary state by state. They do the same with adoption. So you probably want to use for both of those lawyers in the state that you're located in. And then I just gave a couple different agencies um, that you could use um, that are out there. And then other 
adoption resources as well. Okay, barriers and solutions to accessing treatments. So where I find people struggle with fertility before and after cancer is they don't, people don't get the information. So a lot of times you don't get the information, you're so um, stressed by getting the diagnosis of cancer and your cancer doctor is quite busy. So the last thing on their mind is fertility. And so sometimes they just give you a pamphlet and say, well, if you're interested, you know, but at that time you're like, oh my goodness, you know, I'm, I'm focused on my cancer, which is fine. But the important thing to know is I don't need a lot of time to preserve, preserve fertility. Um, and also it's just not as scary as I think a lot of people think. So hopefully that can be one of the takeaways. Um, and then it's pretty safe to get pregnant afterwards, depending again on your treatments. Cost, yes, is a barrier, especially if we're talking about adoption, gestational carriers, egg donors, all of that stuff is ex extremely costly. But like I said, if you're freezing eggs beforehand or embryos beforehand, usually we have ways to help with that. Um, I threw some average treatment costs in here. It, 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 it totally varies. What I would say is if you're interested in something, contact the fertility center that you want to work with and ask them for pricing. If you wanna look at ours, it's on our website. We're very open and upfront about it. Um, these, you know, I kind of threw ballparks in there um, just because it, it, it just varies so much on what you're gonna do, where you're gonna go. Um, like I said, there are ways that we can help with the cost. Um, the cost for an IVF cycle for cancer patients, if it's a Fertile Hope affiliated treatment center, um, is usually around 5,500 bucks, which is basically cost. Um, usually it's around 10 to $12,000. And then the medications, like I said, for the most part, I can get those all free. Um, I put more um, resources out there for fertility options for people if they have more questions. Um, Melody, that's it from a female standpoint. Um, do you have questions before I jump into the men? Um, for the last slide, are you able to email me that? Ooh. Yeah, the fertility, yeah. Kirsten, do you know? Do you have Melody's email? Can I give it to you? Hang on, you're on mute, Kirsten. <laughs> so I'll take a picture of this, this and send it to you, Melody. I do have your email. I'll send it tomorrow morning, though, OK? In the? Nope, nope, don't tell me now. Uh, I, I know what it is. I know what it is. Infinite 38. OK, wait, wait, wait. 